Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Before we begin today's session of the Hindu analysis, an important announcement. Baiju's Exam Prep IAS is bringing for you a very important workshop where Mukesh Jha sir will be discussing how to read the newspapers most effectively for the civil services examination. This workshop will be held on 13th of March at 11 a.m. The link to register for the workshop is given in the description of the video. Now let's begin today's session. The first article that we have here focuses on the water management issue that we have in India. Now, this is no secret that India as a country altogether is facing water crisis of various kinds. There is not enough water for irrigation. We also have many major cities in India that are running out of water and will run out of water in the coming years. For example, we saw what happened in Chennai a couple of years back. We also have the Niti Aayog report saying that cities such as Delhi, etc. will run out of water very soon. This article focuses on all those issues which are related to water somehow or the other. The author here says that there are multiple reports around the world published by credible sources that point towards the water issue that we are facing as the entire country. And that is why there is no doubt over the fact that in the coming years, the water problem in India will only enlarge. The example that the author gives here is that in 2003, the Global Water System Project was formed as a joint initiative of the Earth System Science Partnership and the Global Environment Change. This program talks about the concerns of human-induced transformation of fresh water, meaning that out of the multiple reasons why we have a water problem in India and across the world, most of the reasons are actually human-made. We are responsible for the problems that we are facing in terms of water issues in India. The other example that the author here gives is that the IPCC in their fourth assessment report in 2007 had said that there is an important link between societal vulnerability and modification of water system. Means the lesser water that you have available at your disposal, the lower will be your social prestige and the more vulnerable you would be to the changes in the society. The gap between the demand and the supply of fresh water specifically can reach up to 40% by 2030. So out of 100 people who require fresh water, only 60 of them would get it as per their needs while the other 40 would not get it. And water is such a major concern around the world that it is also a part of the sustainable development goals that the nations have set to achieve by 2030. The UN World Water Development Report of 2021 which was titled Valuing Water, focuses on multiple aspects of water, including the water sources, so sources from where we can get fresh water, the water infrastructure, the pipelines, etc. that the nations are making. For example, in India and in many other countries, there is a lot of problem of water leakage. So water transported from one place to the other has a lot of leakage in between, which is because of the water infrastructure. Then water services, water as an input to production and socio-economic development and the socio-cultural values of water. All these are aspects which have been discussed in this UN report of 2021. Now, the author takes an example of a project that the government of India has been undertaking to ensure that we can at least have a river where we can transfer water from a surplus river. He talks about the project of inter-basin transfer. Around the world, there are about 110 water transfer mega projects that have either been executed already or are under the planning stage. In India, one of those projects is the Kane Betwa River Link project, which was also mentioned in the budget of 2022. Now, this is not a new project. It was first mooted by the government in 1970, but somehow could never be implemented. Now, keeping this in mind, the author here is raising a few questions about this project. Question number one, have we considered the use of water in the future as well? For instance, right now, the government aims to transfer surplus water from the Kane River in Madhya Pradesh to the Betwa River in Uttar Pradesh. But has the government considered that maybe in the coming future, the usage of water in Kane River might increase? The population in the region might increase and they would need more water. Then what would happen? Secondly, even the rainfall in this surplus basin of the Kane River will reduce in the coming years, which has been supported by multiple studies. Has that been taken into consideration or not? Second question that the author raises here is, by 2016, India created an irrigation potential for 112 million hectares. Irrigation potential means by building canals so that we can transfer water from rivers or lakes to the fields. But we have not utilized it completely. 
out of this potential of 112 million hectare, we have only irrigated area which is 93 million hectares. Thus, the canal irrigation system is not being utilized to the fullest in India. In fact, in 1950-51, the canal irrigation in India used to contribute about 40% of the net irrigated area, which has now come down to about less than 24%. So the government has not focused on building canals to connect the fields with the water bodies. Now this tells us a very important fact. See, as a farmer in your field, if you are not getting water from the canals, the other option that you would have is that you would take out water from the ground. And because there are not enough canals built, a lot of farmers are now depending overtly on extracting water from the ground, which is adding to our problems. The author says that groundwater irrigation now covers over 62% of the net irrigated area, which is extremely high. The average water use efficiency in India is only 38%, while it is 50 to 60% in case of developed nations. So of the 100 liters water that we are extracting, only 38 liters is being used properly, which is 50 to 60% in case of other developed nations. We also need to focus on the crops that we have chosen. So in India, we have rice and wheat as a staple crop, which is consumed all around the country. These two crops specifically in India consume more water than the world average. That may be because of various reasons. Maybe because the farmers don't have to pay a bill on water. They extract a lot of water. Maybe because they don't have to pay electricity bill. They use their water extraction generators for a long time. And that is why they are using a lot more water as compared to what the world average is. Not just this, the quality of soil also determines how much water do you require for your crop. If the content of organic material in your soil is declining, you would obviously need more water. That is a problem that India again is facing. In India, 90% of the water is used alone by the agriculture sector, which is not really something that we can compromise on because water is a necessary component of any agricultural activity. The one thing that we can focus on is to ensure that the water loss due to leakage is controlled. Right now in the domestic sector, there is a 30 to 40% loss of water due to leakage. And that is where water related infrastructure has to be corrected by the government at the state and at the center level. The other question raised by the author is the inadequate use of grey water. So grey water basically means, for example, you have washed your utensils, you have washed your clothes. So the water that is a residue of that activity, that is grey water. Yes, you cannot drink it, you cannot bathe from it, but it can still be used for a lot of other activities, but it is hardly used in our country. 55 to 75% of domestic water use turns into grey water depending on the nature of the use. A lot of times this grey water directly or indirectly ends up in the fresh water bodies that is also a cause of concern and is a major reason for increasing pollution in major water bodies across the country. Now, although there are multiple points mentioned in this article, I would like to focus on two. First, the wastewater management concept in India. Now, India, because of the huge population that we have, generates a lot of wastewater every single day. So it is always advisable to have a method to treat this wastewater and reuse it in some way or the other. The official figures say that 78% of sewage generated in India remains untreated and is disposed in rivers, groundwater or lakes, thus polluting these water bodies and the groundwater that we have. One third of India's wastewater is currently treated, only one third, which has a high burden of waterborne diseases because a lot of wastewater does not get treated and is thus disposed in water bodies where small children and other people go ahead and take a bath or make undertake activities such as fishing, etc., which harms the entire food chain. Now, there are a couple of good examples that we can learn from. One, Awadi Sewage Treatment Plant, which is in Chennai. So, the Tamil Nadu Police Housing Corporation constructed an off-grid sewage treatment plant, which improves the living condition of the police housing society. It has been extremely successful and the treated water has in fact provided for a pond where fishing and vegetable cultivation is taking place. Similar example can be seen in Kolkata also where we have a concept of aquaculture. So farmers around the Kolkata city have developed this practice where they use the domestic sewage for fish culture and other agricultural purposes, which can be implemented in other parts of the country as well. The other aspect of this article which I want to focus is India's national water policy. 
Now, the current national water policy that we are following in India was drafted in the year 2012. However, in the past couple of years, there have been a lot of talks that India needs a new water policy. And a few months back, there was a draft new water policy that was submitted to the Ministry of Jal Shakti. No decision has been taken as yet. So right now, we are still following the 2012 policy, but the government is working to introduce a new policy to match with the current requirements. The suggestions in this new draft include, number one, shifting the focus from increasing the supply of water to ensuring that the demand is managed. So earlier, we used to focus on how can we get more water for our use. Now the question has shifted. Rather than focusing on how to get more water, we should focus on how to utilize the water in the best possible way of the resources that we have right now, which can include diversifying our cropping pattern, being less dependent on rice and wheat. For example, we produce lot more rice and wheat as compared to what we require. We store it in the FCI go-downs and then we export it. Now, when you are exporting rice to some other country, you are not just exporting rice. You are exporting all the water also that we took out from under the ground and used it to cultivate rice. So many other countries which can cultivate rice, they don't do that. They just prefer importing it from countries such as India, which is leading to India's groundwater being decreased. The other suggestion of this new draft policy is to shift the focus within the supply side because the country is running out of sites for further construction of large dams, etc. So the problem is not that much about not having enough water. The problem is more about how to ensure that most efficient supply chain is prepared for water resources in India. This table here shows you the decreasing per capita water availability in India, which has been declining at a continuous rate. And with increasing population, it will continue to decline even further in the coming years. The next article that we have here talks about the increasing urbanization of the state of Tamil Nadu. Now, in simple terms, the authors here are making a point that increasingly Tamil Nadu is urbanizing. Now, this means two things. Number one, a lot more population is shifting to the cities as compared to rural areas. Secondly, a lot of areas which were designated as villages earlier are now designated as urban areas because now they are subsumed in big cities. For example, let's assume there used to be a village near Chennai 20 years back or 15 years back. Now when Chennai is expanding because the population is increasing, those villages on the outskirts of Chennai have now become a part of urban areas and they are a part of Chennai itself. This is urbanization. Now it has two major implications. The first implication is because a lot of government schemes such as Manarega etc are only for the rural areas, that means that the people living in those areas, which were earlier villages and now they are a part of urban areas, they will not get benefit of those schemes. Because Manarega, for example, is only a rural area scheme. So a person living in an urban area cannot get benefit of Manarega. The good point about this is that if you used to own a land in that area, your land would now have much more value. Land in the village would have a lesser value and the same land in an urban area would have a higher value. So where is it that the government has to draw a line? How does the government ensure that the rights of both these populations are safeguarded is what this article is discussing. The article is focusing on Tamil Nadu specifically and says that in the past few years, we have seen that more than half of Tamil Nadu's population now lives in the urban areas. So much so that the government has realized it and they have made new urban development authorities in cities such as Madurai, Coimbatore, Tiruppur and Hosur, just like we had the Chennai Metropolitan Development Authority. It is expected that by 2036, urban population in Tamil Nadu will reach two thirds of the entire population of the state, meaning that agriculture now is turning into just a residual sector in Tamil Nadu rather than being the dominant sector. The government surveys show us that only 26% of the rural household, not all household, but only rural households in the state of Tamil Nadu depend on agriculture as their main source of livelihood. Then what do the other people do? Mostly others are dependent on government schemes such as Manarega, etc. to earn their livelihood. Now, this number is very, very low as compared to other states. For example, in Kerala, one third of rural households have agriculture as their main source of income. Similarly, the number is 61% in Gujarat, 54% in Maharashtra. So as you can see, 
the number is pretty low in case of Tamil Nadu means a lot more people in Tamil Nadu are dependent on schemes such as Manarega as compared to the other states. And that is why their area turning into an urban area will be detrimental for them because they won't have the benefit of Manarega from now onwards. The authors say that 62% of farm household income comes from the wage labor in Tamil Nadu. Wage labor again is pointing towards Manarega only. Now, what are the other sectors where people usually find jobs in Tamil Nadu? So in Tamil Nadu, the people who are working in the manufacturing industry have been around 20% only for more than a decade. Ideally, this number should increase because if more people are coming to the cities from villages, the jobs that they should take up should be manufacturing. So this number should ideally increase, but it has not happened so far. If you compare this with Gujarat, in Gujarat, the number of workforce who are working in the manufacturing sector has increased from 16% to 20% in the past 15 years or so. That is another cause of concern for Tamil Nadu because they are not providing for their population who is shifting to the cities in large numbers. Now, the government of Tamil Nadu realized this, that Manarega would not be applicable to these places who are turning into urban areas. So they announced that like Manarega, we will have our own scheme. But the problem with that scheme is they have only given it a budget of 100 crore rupees, which is very, very low. They don't even have any support from the union government for this scheme. And that is why it is difficult to see how this scheme can be compared with Manarega. The government has other challenges also. When more people shift towards the cities because they can't afford housing, they usually develop slums and start living in those slum areas, which leads to lesser standard of living, which leads to a lot more diseases, etc. And the government cannot afford that. So government also needs to provide for affordable housing, healthcare, subsidized food, etc. for this population that is shifting from the rural areas to the urban areas. Another important factor here to consider is that a lot of times a union government is being seen as encroaching on those policy matters where the state government should have been given the free hand. For example, Tamil Nadu has set up a lot of welfare boards that look into the problems such as maternity, agriculture, pension, old age, etc. But the union government has been trying to bring all these kind of laws under the power of the union government. For example, the union government recently codified the labor laws and one of the objectives behind this was they wanted same kind of labor laws to exist throughout the country. This reduces the scope of governments such as Tamil Nadu to give more help to their people which the union government will not allow them. One other key aspect here is that one of the ways in which the state government could have earned more money for starting schemes such as Manarega for the urban areas is that they could have earned more money from the property taxes, which again has not happened. Tamil Nadu, despite being the most urban state of India, has a property tax collection of only 2500 crore, which is again much lower as compared to states such as Maharashtra and Karnataka. So while people turning towards urban areas might be a good thing in some aspect, but the state government of Tamil Nadu has to work on a lot of aspects to ensure that the life of the people becomes better. Now, urbanization is one of those topics which you see in your paper very frequently in a number of ways. It can be a part of your essay paper, it can be a part of your GS2 paper, it can be a part of GS3 paper also. So you need to know some details about how urbanization impacts the life of the people, not just in rural, but in the urban areas as well. Now, India, because of having such a large population, has the second largest urban population in the entire world in terms of the number of people. Now, urbanization would also generate a lot of jobs if there are good enough opportunities available in the cities and if people have the required skill set. For an economy, overall, it is seen as a good sign because if a same person is working in the village, he or she might have a job that pays him or her lesser money. If the same person comes to city, that person might earn more money. So overall, it would give a boost to the country's GDP. The productivity also increases when the rural farmers become urban factory workers. The other way in which it will help is that it will reduce disguised unemployment. Because in villages, we see a practice where 10 or 12 people would be working on a field where only four or five people would have been enough. So the extra people, when they shift to the cities, it leads to a boost to the GDP of the country. So that is a good thing. We can also learn from the example of China. Between 1978 and 2018, in these 40 years, China's urbanization rate jumped from 18 to 58%. As a result of which, 
50 crore people from China were lifted out of poverty and they became a part of the middle class. India still has a long way to go. India's current urban population is about one third, which is much lower than China or even Indonesia. So India still has a long way to go to achieve that status. Now, on the other hand, there are also many negative aspects to urbanization. For example, look at most of our major cities in India. Let's take an example of Bangalore. And not just Bangalore, you can take example of Chennai, Mumbai, etc. None of our cities have been planned to sustain with so much population as we have forced on them right now. Bangalore, for example, that earlier was known for its beautiful lakes, now faces water problems and these water problems will only increase in the future. A lot of cities are flooded during monsoons and they also see a period of drought just after a few months. Take an example of Chennai, a city which sees floods also and a city which has seen drought also just a few months apart. When people shift towards urban areas, they are also exposing themselves to a lot more air pollution, a lot more sound pollution, resulting in a lot more premature deaths as compared to earlier. We also have problems of water scarcity that we discussed in the first article that will only increase when more people get involved in the manufacturing sector. India also faces a problem of not giving due importance and investment in the urban infrastructure projects. India spends only $17 per capita on urban infrastructure projects as compared to the world average of at least $100 and China's average of $116. That is why you see that a lot of Indian cities right now are not being able to cope up with the increasing population. And the property tax issue that we discussed earlier as well. Most urban cities, even the big cities in India, do not have a great track record when it comes to collecting the property taxes that the people owe to them. All these things have to be worked upon if we have to ensure that urbanization is successful in India. The next article from today's newspaper focuses on the elderly care. The article here says that in India, we don't really have any good policy to take care of the elderly people in our society. In the past few years, we have seen the rise of a lot of organizations and agencies. Some are for profit, some are not for profit who work in this sector of giving care and support to the elderly people. The non-profit ones are the ones which are run by NGOs, religious organizations, voluntary organizations, etc. And then there are some which are for profit, which run as a kind of a hostel or an elder care society. This concept is much more prevalent in countries of Europe, US, etc where you have to pay a monthly fee to them and they will take care of the elders while giving them all the aid that they require in day-to-day -day life. In India, although we have some elderly homes, but as per the author, many of these homes do not have any standard operating procedure and thus they are not really in a position to take good care of our elders right now. The authors say that as per the UN World Population Aging Report, India's aging population will increase to 20% by 2050 from 8% now. Now, this is an outcome of a country that is developing and is on the right path. So, India right now is at a stage where our medical healthcare facilities have become so good as compared to 30-40 years back that people now have a much higher lifespan. Now, because we have an increasing elderly population because of our good healthcare facility, we also have to ensure that we can provide for them and we have good policies to take care of them, which we have neglected so far. Now, there was a study conducted by a Hyderabad-based entity while they went to about 40 elder homes. They found out that at least 30% people or 30% elders living there had some vision impairment of some sort. Some just needed better glasses, some just needed a simple procedure to ensure that their vision becomes better. But the problem is that all of them were neglected. And that is why, what is the use of having these elder homes when they can't even take care of such a small issue? In many of these homes, even the elders who can do their own work, who can walk, who can perform some household duties are asked to stay back and do nothing in the entire day, which leads to lack of sociability, which also leads to lack of independence and it might lead to mental health issues in these elders. And that is why we have to be very, very careful in dealing with them and ensuring that they have a much better life in the later stages. The elder homes that we have should be guided by a specific policy of the government. They should have social environment that is suited for the elderly. They should be disabled friendly, etc., which is not the case right now as per the authors. Now, just to give you an example of the kind of population growth that we are expecting. 
Now, let me give you a very interesting example of Japan. Now, Japan is a country which has a very slow growth of population and because of its excellent healthcare facility, it also has a very low death rate. So what has happened in Japan is that many elder people have only one son or one daughter and many of them are either busy working or either have moved to other cities or other countries. As a result of which, many elders in Japan are actually feeling very lonely. So what they do is they actually go out and commit a crime. A very common crime, let's say they steal something, let's say they go ahead and harm a government property. The reason is that because they commit a crime, they will be sent to jail. And in jail, at least they would have someone to talk to, they would have someone to socialize with. And that is why there is such a big problem in Japan of elder people actually committing a crime so that they can go to jail and socialize with other people. Such an issue is being faced in Japan right now because the elders are facing loneliness in this country. I'm not saying the same will happen in India, but the problem of elderly people and taking care of them is a worldwide phenomenon. Now in India, the elderly population as per the World Health Organization will rise from 6 crore to over 22 crore by 2050. The government also looking into this aspect did release a policy for older persons in 2011. The policy's objectives included encouraging the individuals to make provisions for their own and their spouse during the old age, encouraging the families to take care of the older family members. It also tried to encourage the NGOs for taking care of older people and ensuring that healthcare facilities are provided. But again, such policies are just in the form of guidelines and they don't really translate into something concrete on the ground. There are a few examples of government schemes also in this respect. For example, we have the Indira Gandhi National Old Pension Scheme. That is an old age pension scheme for people above the age of 60 and belong to the BPL category. Then we have the Rashtriya Vayoshri Yojana for providing physical aid and assisted living devices for senior citizens who belong to the BPL category. Similarly, we have other schemes which are run by the central government and at the state level also, many respective state governments have these kind of pension schemes running for the old age citizens. However, we don't have a policy specifically that tells the elderly homes how to be constructed and how to work to take care of these elders. The next article here, focuses on the inland water transport system in the northeast part of India and how it can be a game changer in the future. Now, the reason why this is in the news is that MV Lal Bahadur Shastri, where MV means motor vessel, that is a ship that is propelled by internal combustion engine. So, this ship actually reached Guwahati's Pandu port from the southern bank of Brahmaputra on the 6th of March. It took about a month since it started from Patna, from the Ganga River. Now the ship has been carrying about 200 metric tons of food grains from the Food Corporation of India and has brought all these food grains to Guwahati. Now this is seen as a great beginning and a method that can be used for transporting food grains and other material through the inland waterways that we have in India. As the article says, this motor vessel that is a Lal Bahadur Shastri MV started on 5th of Feb from Patna on Ganga River through the National Waterway 1 and reached Guwahati on 6th of March. Interestingly, it actually came there through Bangladesh. That also is a key point here. And that is why the Bangladesh government also has to be thanked since they also played a major role in ensuring all these permissions. The shipping cargo from Patna to Pandu, as I said, is a part of Food Corporation of India's pilot project. And since this is successful, it will be carried on at a much better frequency in the future. The first such experiment was carried out in the year 2018 and similar other waterways now are being discussed and we will see that in the coming months, similar other ships will take the same path to ensure that there is delivery of goods from one place to the other by using the inland waterways of India. Now, inland waterways specifically is a luxury that only a few countries including India have and that is why it is important to ensure that we exploit it. Assam, for example, had exploited it very, very well at the time of our independence. Assam's per capita income, in fact, was the highest in the country at the time of our independence amongst all the states, mainly because it had access to a lot of very precious commodities, including tea, timber, coal, oil industry, as well as the seaports, which gave it connectivity to the Bay of Bengal via the Brahmaputra River. 
the ferry services which used to be the lifeline of all these industries continued after 1947 also but after the 1965 war with pakistan these services were discontinued since then there have been a lot of security implications in that area and that is why the governments over the years have not really tried to resume this particular way of transportation now the resumption of this cargo transport now through bangladesh has come at a cost where the two countries have signed a deal and india is the one that has invested most of the money but in the long run it is being seen as a great initiative india has invested about 80% of the money to improve the navigability of these two stretches as a part of the indo bangladesh protocol the government had taken up a lot of dredging projects dredging projects means the governments have to ensure that the bed of the waterway is cleared there is a lot of rock sand etc on the bed of the river that has to be cleared so that the big ships can actually navigate properly over it that requires a lot of investment which the indian government did do for this particular route the indian government in fact has also undertaken the jal marg vikas project and invested a huge amount of money to ensure that national waterway one becomes an easy way for government to ensure sustainable movement of vessels that weigh up to 2000 tons because india being a huge country would really benefit from such alternate mode of transportation now specifically since 2014 when the modi government came to power they have been keeping a very close eye on developing national waterways across the country now just a few months back we only used to have six national waterways as you can see here in the picture but when the modi government came to power they announced over 100 other national waterways to be developed by the government in the coming months india right now has over 5000 km of navigable inland waterways under development the best part about using waterway as a mode of transportation is that it has the lowest operating cost amongst all other modes of transportation realizing this potential in 1986 the inland waterways authority of india was set up which has been responsible for developing and regulating inland waterways in the country as i said earlier when the new government came to power in 2014 about 106 additional waterways were announced under the national waterway act of 2016 as a result of which the total cargo volume that was transported through inland waterways in india increased by about 19% year after year in the last 5 years and that is why there is a lot of potential that we still see as a result of this successful pilot project that has just been carried out now most of this potential of inland waterways is in northern part of the country since most of the southern india rivers are seasonal and thus are not really suited for navigation although we do have some navigable canals in india including the buckingham canal in andhra pradesh now just to give you an idea as i said earlier transporting cargo through waterways is by far the most affordable way of transporting however india has not been able to utilize its potential completely if you see the amount of material that we transport in india still is much much lower as compared to japan or china or even the eu despite the fact that india has a lot of naturally gifted rivers that are very suitable for this kind of transportation the next article is focused on the big new rbi initiative called the upi 123 pay in simple terms with this initiative now the people who don't have smartphones who have normal feature phones would also be able to use the upi facility this facility is called upi 123 pay now as you know upi or the unified payments interface was launched in 2016 and has now become one of the most used digital payment platforms in the entire country with year after year the number and the amount of upi transactions increasing at an exponential pace now one fact that you have to understand is even before this initiative there was an option for the feature phone users to use upi it's not that they could not do it earlier just that before that it was a very cumbersome process they had to use a short code star double line hash and they had to send multiple messages and each of this message was charged on the user that is why it was a very cumbersome process so upi 123 pay has not introduced a new feature just that it has made the earlier feature much easier to use now as compared to earlier for the people to use this feature they will be required to undertake an onboarding process and they have to link their bank account to their feature phone and just set a upi pin as we do for the smartphones as well 
then the UPI account will be linked to their debit card for authenticating their transactions. There are multiple options given for the feature phone users under this particular scheme. For example, they can use the IVR, so they can call a number, press 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever the options are to undertake the UPI transaction. They can also have app-based functionality. So there is an app that has been developed for feature phones as well in which they can have this UPI facility. Then there's a missed call facility. They can give a missed call to a certain number and they will be asked to confirm their UPI pin. Then we can also have proximity sound-based payment. So if they are near a merchant, they can also pay the merchant using their phones. All these options are given under the new UPI 123 pay facility. Now, India is not the first country to do this. There are other countries also that have this kind of a system where the mobile payments are not reliant on internet connectivity. This kind of a system exists in Kenya. We also have this system in Congo, Egypt, Ghana, Mozambique and Tanzania where there are companies that have allowed UPI transactions without the need of having internet connectivity. So India is not a pioneer in that field in that sense. Now about UPI specifically also you need to know a bit of details because these kind of questions are very commonly asked in the prelims examination. So UPI as you know is a product of the National Payments Corporation of India which is an initiative of RBI and Indian Banks Association and set up in 2007. It is a not-for-profit company and is registered under the Companies Act of 1956. This NPCI offers other systems as well, including the IMPS, the Bharat Pays payment system, etc. But UPI is the most well-known amongst all the payment options that are given by the NPCI. NPCI launched the UPI system in 2016, as we discussed earlier. And today, India's digital payment industry is growing at a very, very fast pace. There are obviously some challenges associated with it, as is the case with any technology that we have. That is a problem of cyber attack and cyber malware. For example, there's a software that is known as Cerberus, which is known to have fraudulent claims and hacking into the people's account when they are using any payment system. So obviously, when you use any technology, you have to build a security network around it. These were the articles we wanted to discuss on the Hindu newspaper today. A couple of practice questions. Number one, examine the national water policy of India and discuss its potential in promoting the water use efficiency in agriculture. Second, what are the challenges involved in developing the inland water transport in India and its advantages? What steps need to be taken to tap this potential? Both the questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.